Little Britches. Father and I were ranchers. Chapter 2. Neighbors. Father had just led the horses back to the barn when a man drove into our yard with a pair of fast-stepping bays. He drove right past the house and swung around in a circle. His horses didn't slow down all the way around, but pulled up beside us with the pole of the buckboard pushing their collars away up high on their necks. The man wasn't quite so old as father, but he was as tall and a lot heavier. He stepped out of the rig without putting the line down and held his right hand out to father. I'm Fred Altland, your next door neighbor, a mile up the line, he said. After father shook his hands and told him he was Charles Moody, Mr. Altland held his hand out to me. I tried to take a hold of it as father did, but it was too big, and I only got hold of three fingers. And mine's Ralph Moody, I said. I like you. I did like Mr. Altland, right from the start. And I like a man that speaks his mind, he told me. Then he said to father, Here you had a little hard luck with your team, and I thought I'd drop in to see if I couldn't lend a hand. I got half a dozen teams standing around, eating their heads off at this time of year. Better let me lend you one till yours gets back on its feet again. Father said, thank you, Mr. Altland, but I believe we'll make out all right. Of course, these fellows will be stiff for a few days, but I haven't got much hauling to do, and I don't think the black is hurt very bad. Mr. Altland said, hell, Charlie, don't call me mister. My name's Fred. He stepped over near Bill and pushed his thumb down hard on his back along the hip. He looked at Father and lifted one eyebrow. All he said was, kidney? He and Father talked about the horses and kidneys for a while. Then Mr. Altland said he was going to Fort Logan and asked if there was anything he could bring us. Father sent me to ask Mother, and she told me the name of some kind of salve for the horses, but when I got back outside, I had forgotten it. Mr. Altland was already on his buckboard. He said, never mind. I'll get you some stuff that works wonders with galls and wire cuts. Then he let the lines go loose in just a half a second. His team was away like Santa Claus's reindeer. When Mr. Altland came back, his horses were still running as fast as they were when he left. He drove around the circle as he had before and pulled up right beside the back steps. Father had gone to see if he could find the stakes that marked the corners of our land. So Mother went to the door. Mr. Altland gave her a quart jar of blue-colored salve, a big square package, and a Denver post. He said, tell Charlie to lay this stuff on over those sores good and heavy. It's got blue vitriol in it. But tell him not to be afraid of it. It'll dry those sores up quicker than anything else. Mother looked at the package, and Mr. Altland grinned. Just a little baker's bread for the kids. I figured... You both have your hands full without bacon for a couple of days. Mother thanked him and asked how much we owed him. Forget it, he said. Bessie, your mother will probably be down to borrow something off of you before the week's out. Thank you ever so much, and tell him I shall be delighted to see them, Mother said as he turned away. Mr. Altlin called, say, I don't see any cows around here. What are you going to give these kids for milk? We were all watching out through the window. Mother's face got red as could be, and she said, Oh, we have a whole case of evaporated milk. They'll be all right. That stuff's only good for chuck wagons, he said. Then he yelled, Hey, Ralph, get your jacket on and take a ride with me. I just got a glimpse of the headline on the newspaper as I was getting my coat on. It said, Man Killed by Mountain Lion at Moffat. Then... Mother put it up on the lamp shelf. When I climbed on the buckboard beside Mr. Altland, he reached over and slapped me on the leg. It was a good hard slap, but I liked it. As we tore out of our yard, he asked me if I'd ever driven a team. I told him, yes, father let me hold the lines when we were bringing out the lumber. He passed his reins right over to me and said, here, take a hold of them. Better wrap them around your hands once. You ain't very stout yet. He showed me how to wrap the lines around my hands so they wouldn't slip and told me to hold them up tight. The long-legged bays 
were running like 60, and I was scared. I pulled on the lines as hard as I could, but all that happened was that my bottom slipped forward on the seat. Mr. Altman put his arm around me and held me back so I could pull harder. He said, Bet you my life, you'll make a horseman. If you was my kid, I'd put a box in front so you'd have something to brace your feet against. As we got close to his house, he gathered both my hands inside one of his and helped me pull. The bays only slowed up a little, and the hind wheels of the buckboard slewed way around when we turned into his driveway. Altland's house was four times the size of ours, and there was a big red barn and corrals, and the fields beyond were knee-deep with brown stubble. A tall, pretty girl came out to meet us when we stopped by the back door of the house. She had reddish-brown hair, and her eyes were the same color as a brand-new penny. She must have been 19 or 20. Sis, Mr. Altland said, this is our new neighbor. There's a whole parcel of kids, and they haven't got a cow. How about taking them over some milk? That woman seems to be right nice, and said she'd be glad to see you. While the girl was asking me what my name was and telling me hers, Mr. Altland tied the horses to a hitching rack and went off to the barn. She said her mother was frying a batch of donuts and asked if I wouldn't like to come in and have a hot one. I said, yes, I would, Miss Altland. We haven't had any hot donuts since we left East Rochester. She laughed and said, Don't you dare call me Miss Altland. It makes me sound like a school marm. You call me Bessie. Come on now, we'll get some donuts. Mrs. Altland was as nice as Bessie. She wasn't very tall, but fat and with wavy gray hair. When I told her I liked Bessie and her husband fine, she laughed and tweaked my ear. That's the finest compliment I've had in years, she said but don't you let Fred fool you. He's just a little boy, only he's big. He ain't even 30 yet. And don't you go calling him Mr. Altland. It'll get him all stuck up. You call him Fred. Bessie didn't let me drive going back. Maybe she didn't know I wanted to. She and mother got along fine. I went out to the barn where father was putting some of the blue salve on Bill and Nig. When we came back to the house, Bessie was saying to mother, I'm not going to keep saying Mrs. Moody. What shall I call you? Mother laughed and said, That's just the way I'd like to have it. My name is Mary, but nobody ever calls me that. When I was a girl, they used to call me Molly. Bessie said, All right, Molly it is. I'll be seeing you often, Molly. She picked up the reins and was gone. While we were eating supper that night, the coyotes began to howl. It sounded as though there were dozens of them, some close by and some far away. It made shivers run up and down my back, and I think it did the same thing to mother. As soon as supper was over, father got up and took the lantern from the nail by the door. He turned up the globe. Mother put both hands up to her cheek and said, Charlie, you're not going out there. I won't let you go out there. Father had lit the lantern. He set it down and took mother in his arms. Mame, he said, we'll have to face the situations we find in this country. These fellows can't be too dangerous, or Altland would have warned us. If the horses were in shape to defend themselves, I wouldn't go. But they're not. I've rolled the wagon across the open side of the barn, so they can't break out again. Coyotes are said to be afraid of light. I've got to hang this lantern on the wagon. He picked up the lantern and went out. Mother stood in the open doorway, and we watched the lantern till it disappeared around the barn. The coyotes howling stopped. In a few minutes, Father was back and said everything looked all right at the barn. Then the howling started again. Mother was still fidgety and asked, Where is Moffat, Charlie? Father looked at her and answered, Moffat? Oh, it's in the mountains west of here somewhere. Why? Oh, nothing, Mother said. I just wondered, that's all. Mother put the smaller children to bed while Grace and I did the dishes, and she made us go just as soon as we were finished. The coyotes stopped howling after a little while, but we couldn't go to sleep. Grace whispered over and asked me if I thought the mountain lions had come down and frightened the coyotes away. I was afraid they had, but I told her not to worry, because Father wouldn't let them get us. He must have heard us whispering, because he came to the door and said he didn't want to hear any more whispering. 
Father always meant what he said, so we kept quiet. And I guess we went to sleep pretty soon. The moon was way over toward the mountains when something woke me up. It woke everybody else, too. My heart was pounding so hard, I thought it was going to jump out. Then there was a clatter on the back of the house. Something had knocked a pile of firewood over. Grace shrieked, The mountain lion! And all the younger children yelled, as though the lion had them by the ears. Father leaped out of bed and ran to the kitchen for the lantern. I guess he thought Grace had really seen the lion. Mother rushed from one window to the other, slamming down tight and crying, Don't go out, Charlie, don't go out. He'll kill you the way he did the man at Moffat. Father didn't go out. He sat on the edge of the girl's bed with Muriel on his knee and one arm around Mother while he told us there wasn't a bit of danger. Everybody stopped crying pretty soon, but they were all holding their breath as I was. It was so still, it almost hurt, but only for a few minutes. Then the most terrible noise I'd ever heard came from right outside our window. We were all too scared to make a sound till I heard Mother whisper, Oh God, and knew she was praying. A few minutes later, there was an awful racket at the barn. We heard one of the horses squeal and the sound of heels thudding against the boards. Mother had to read to us a long time before we went back to sleep. At daylight, Father went to the barn to see if we had any horses left. In a couple of minutes, he was back in the kitchen door, laughing and calling us all to come out to the barn. Cold as it was, Mother let us go without caps or coats. Standing between the two big horses was a Rocky Mountain canary, a little donkey, not much taller than I. He'd been our mountain lion of the night and had squeezed into the barn past the tailgate of the wagon. And we'll stop reading for now and finish this chapter up next time. Until then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks for listening. Love you guys. Bye-bye.